Okay, good morning and a very warm welcome from IPA to all of you. Many of you will be familiar with IPA, but for many students, uh, a brief introduction. I'm uh, Samandana Nanal from TIFR. I used to be IPA General Secretary in the past. Today, I'm just uh, representing the uh, IP General Secretary, the present uh, uh, office bearer, uh, Dr. Aradhana Srivastava, who could not uh, join just now due to some technical problems. So Indian Physics Association was founded in 1970, over about five decades back, with a goal to uh, facilitate uh, interactions within the physics community, physics teachers and students interested in uh, knowing about the physics and bring the latest developments to uh, the physics. This is achieved through a various series of lectures and uh, various uh, uh, bullet, uh, the, the books and the bulletins which are brought out regularly. Uh, keeping up with times, IPA has a web page on the YouTube and the social media channels and you can uh, get information about IPA there. IPA has about 47 chapters spread all over India. It also liaises with other national bodies like uh, Indian academies, gives out biennial awards to senior physicists and young physicists uh, with a uh, goal to promote the talent and uh, also appreciate the work done by physicists for the community. It has international linkages, uh, MOUs and collaborative programs with uh, other uh, physics societies, mainly the APS, uh, Institute of Physics. Okay. We have recently joi uh, joined, uh, have signed an MOU with the Italian Physics Society and is a member of uh, AAPPS, which is the Asia Pacific Region Physics Societies. Membership forms are available on the uh, membership uh, uh, portal, is there and you can directly make the reference. More uh, regularly, IPA publishes a physics news, which is a uh, quarterly bulletin. This is also available on the IPA webpage for free, and I think some of you have contributed to it. From time to time, it brings out special issues. Like a few years back, we uh, brought out an uh, issue on the uh, Meghnath Saha, Satyendra Bose. Uh, similarly, on the last year, there was in 21, there was an issue on uh, Dr. Biba Choudhury, the first uh, woman experimental physicist of India. And I'm very happy to announce that uh, the Physics News is bringing out a special issue showcasing the uh, science done by young women researchers in India. And one of your faculty members, Dipshi, Dr. Dipshika Jaiswalnagar, will be a editor, so a guest editor for this issue. Your today's speaker also was a guest editor of a special climate issue which was brought out last year. As I mentioned, IPA gives biennial awards for uh, senior uh, scientists and uh, uh, younger uh, young scientists. There are also best thesis awards given in uh, various uh, uh, thesis for the best uh, thesis presentation in nuclear physics, solid state physics, and the Olympiad awards. So the goal of the IPA is to reach a wider community, the, the age groups, all the age groups. Yeah. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? So this is actually from the last one. So these were the past uh, office bearers and uh, uh, I uh, hope you will see the new faces now coming in the present office bearers. Yeah, so uh, IPA in 2017 uh, took a step in set up a gender uh, in physics working group and Professor Shorvati uh, Goswami who is a present uh, vice president was the chair of that group earlier. And uh, for, the, for these two years, I will be uh, take, uh, heading that group. And I'm also happy to announce that IPS uh, will uh, co-organize with TIFR the International Conference on Women in Physics, which is the IUPAP series conference. This will be held online in July uh, 23. So we hope to see many of you people there. With this brief introduction, so this I already mentioned about gender group. So yeah. So with this brief introduction, now I would uh, hand over to the uh, local people. So this is just a uh, information to you that go to the IPA website and uh, look at the joining member and you can just fill online. The application needs to be forwarded by a life member of IPA 
And if you have any difficulty in that, please contact the IPA office to get that. We hope many of you to join. We hope that ISA Trivendram will set up a IPA chapter and that we become a very active chapter. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Vangana, for a very uh, detailed introduction to IPA. And I'm sure many of our students have now got to know about IPA and the activity. They will just go and uh, uh, look out for more information and uh, join. And uh, so if you allow us, maybe we begin with the talk. Hello. So shall we start with it? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so a very warm welcome to everybody, and uh, uh, it's a very uh, hard occasion for us. Uh, we are joined with Professor Shankar. Uh, he is the speaker for today's program. Uh, as you know, the program is uh, supported by Indian Physics Organization, so they initiated this process, which is for a TV level lecture, and uh, Professor Shankar gladly accepted it. And two uh, small of a being to actually introduce him. I mean, he, I was born when he did PhD. So he has experience uh, as well as my age. He has been working in starting from string theory to quantum field theory to now atmospheric physics. All the branches of physics he has kind of uh, ventured into. And with that brief introduction, I now welcome Professor Shankar for the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is am I audible? Yes. So let me, uh, let me first thank IPA and ISA Trivandrum for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Uh, so the, this is the what you call the title of the talk. So first, let me give a disclaimer. This talk is talking about how climate climate change was discovered and the uh, scientific ideas. But uh, I'm neither a climate scientist nor a historian of science. So, uh, um, so I, what, the motivation is that when you're sort of trying to appreciate a new subject, then um, it's always good to see how the ideas evolve. So I myself got a lot of appreciation for this topic by doing that. So this is just an attempt to share that with all of you. So this is how the uh, talk is organized. Firstly, just an overview of what we know today, or roughly what uh, is known today. Then how did we get to know what we know? How did the idea sort of evolve from uh, the past? Then something about what is being done today, how these uh, how what is known is being uh, disseminated to the public, that is by this intergovernment panel of, for climate change. And uh, some last few slides about what an arm and sound like you and me can uh, not can do, but anyway, we'll you'll see over there. So firstly, the uh, why is this? Coming. Uh, some basics about weather and climate. Uh, so the climate is a state of the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is a thin film of air that uh, surrounds the earth. Very thin because it's uh, I guess it's not shared to the screen. So oh. Also? Which one? Yes. Yeah, it's good. This one? Yeah. Yes. Okay, this I can hide. Okay. Yeah. Just click on the screen. Just click on the screen. Trying it, it's not going. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. 
does that go? I'll just stop sharing and start sharing okay. again. Oh, it's here. Okay. Still, that shows up. Who's here? Uh, Vivek was here. I'm just calling. Meanwhile, we continue. So, this is escape mode. How do we go about that? I'll just get him. Anyway, it's okay. It's just on the top of the screen. So, um, so you know, the Atlas extends significantly only up to about 50 kilometers, whereas the radius of the Earth is more than 6,400 kilometers. So, very thin uh, film of air. And weather is defined as the state of the atmosphere, pressure, temperature, relative humidity, all the things that come in the newspaper every day, and nowadays on the internet. And all these parameters keep changing day by day, hour by hour, um, I mean, constantly, year by year, there are seasonal changes, daily changes, hourly changes, uh, etc. Uh, and climate is defined as a weather which is averaged over decadal scales, not defined as 10 years or 15 years, but roughly at least 10 years, 20 years, 30 years average. So long term average of the weather is uh, is what we call climate. Now, one thing that uh, climate was never a, uh, never a constant, nothing on the earth was ever a constant. From the time it was formed till the time it will be destroyed, everything is changing very slowly, geological time scales. But uh, Earth was never in thermal equilibrium. It was never even in steady state. It's only uh, changing very slowly, but constantly changing and will presumably continue to constantly change. So when we say climate change, it's not a, what do you call it? Uh, not that it was constant and it is changing now. It was changing very slowly earlier, and now it is changing fast, is the uh, concern. So this gives some um, a, a picture of the temperature of the Earth, gathered by various proxy data by paleoclimists. And uh, so you can see one thing, the scales are different. This is 100 million, then this is tens of millions, the millions, 100,000, etc. So you can see in the past there have been some very hot periods. And then in the last 100,000 years or so, there have been these so-called glacial cycles. Hot periods, cold periods, hot periods, cold periods, what we call commonly the ice ages. Uh, now 20,000 years ago was what the LGM is last glacial maximum, with the coldest period in the, of the last ice age. Then it warmed up and past 10,000 years, it's been pretty safe. Uh, now, human civilization started about 5,000 years ago. So, uh, civilized, I mean, humans have experienced one ice age actually, Homo sapiens, but uh, uh, civilized uh, humans have not ex have experienced a very steady climate. So far. And now it is shooting up. And these are the projections for uh, uh, 2100, 2050. So it's a very rapid change in the recent past, and that is the uh, reason for worry. Uh, okay, now it's um, okay. So now, uh, why are these? It's good. Yeah. So, uh, why is the temperature changing? So, for that, one has to know what's, what determines the temperature of the Earth. Average temperature of the Earth is some 14 degrees centigrade or so. Why is it not 100? Why is it not minus 20? What sets uh, this thing? So, the first person to ask this question was Fourier. Fourier, as you know, developed the theory of heat. Fourier's law of uh, heat conduction, etc. So uh, he was naturally interested in this question. So this thing uh, generates remarks on the temperature of the electric globe and planetary space. Uh, of course, he knew that the sun was heating up the earth, but he, in 19, 
1824, there was not enough of physics known for him to give the full answer. Uh, and we'll come back to that later. It's not uh, changing. Well, it's not responding to either the. I think the mouse control may need to be on this window. It may have gone out on this. Yeah. yeah. No. But how well? Now we know um, basically what determines the temperature of the Earth is energy balance. In the sense that, or any other any body which is getting heated up, uh, there's a source of energy input, and as the body gets hotter, it will radiate out the energy. As it uh, so at some as it gets hotter, it will radiate out more and more energy. At some point of time, the amount going in is equal to amount going out. Amount coming in is equal to amount going out, and the temperature will stabilize at that time. Whatever you're heating up, this is not just for Earth and Sun, this is for gender. So, uh, the energy input of the Sun, energy input of the whole, uh, whole Earth, considered globally, is the Sun, the radiation coming in from the Sun. Now, that actually changes over scales of 10,000 years, there's also a 10 year solar cycle, not so important. But um, so, uh, and we'll talk more about that later. Now, the energy output of the Earth depends on, um, on, on the, basically the average temperature of the Earth. And so, how this, the time it takes to respond will depend on how this incoming energy gets distributed among the Earth, all the various complicated processes that go on there. Then finally, how it is radiated out. So it is a very complex process because the Earth is quite a complex system. And these are the things we are taught at school that you can broadly divide it into atmosphere, biosphere, land surface, hydrosphere, cryosphere. But these are also not sharp divisions. And each of this is a very, very complex system. Each of these are systems. So this, as I said today, the problem why this issue is getting so much attention today is that uh, just after industrial age, there was a sudden pulse of CO2 in, uh, injected into the atmosphere. And then the atmosphere has responded by warming much faster than it did earlier. And uh, so the uh, whole uh, problem is, and it's not just the warming, uh, there will be other effects, sea level rise, increase in extreme events, etc., etc. And all these uh, things, if they happen over a scale of a century, then human beings are going to find it very difficult to adjust to. And as usual, the toll will be on the lower income, the poorer people. Um, okay, so now let's see how uh, the idea slowly uh, came about. So when did people realize that there have been large changes of climate in the past and the climate is never constant and so on? Presumably when people discovered the uh, fact that there were ice ages. I don't know if this is a fact, maybe there were other clues, as I said, I'm not a historian of science. But at least when they discovered there were ice ages, they would have known that there were large changes of climate in the past. And how did they discover it? Geologists basically, uh, the discovery was the geologists in this period spanning about the century, so 1740 to 1840, from geomorphology, literally the shape of the ground. So one of the uh, main pieces of evidence are these huge boulders called erratics, who are found, they are found in various uh, places. I mean, huge rock in the middle of nowhere, nothing else uh, nearby. And also this rock type, if it is very different from the surrounding rock types, then it was not formed there. It was presumably transported. What can transport a thing like this big? Uh, so like this water in the stream cannot transport it. It can only be transported by ice. 
So where you find erratics, you can reasonably conjecture that at some point of time the ice had extended. So now this uh, erratics, I don't know anything about, but this is closer home, Agastoni. And that is uh, here, just uh, in the Uttarakhand. Um, uh, this is Rudrapraya, if you are familiar with this thing, and the Dalakanda River. And it's about 20 kilometers upstream of uh, Rudrapraya, along this river. By the way, these two glaciers are where uh, I work on along with that river. So uh, this is the location of the uh, thing. And you can see it is far away from where the ice is at the moment. Uh, now, uh, the uh, what do you call the, the, the rock of which this uh, erratic is made of is quite different from the rock species found in its neighborhood and is more or less the same as the rock species found in this region. So the conjecture is that of the ice during the ice age extended at least up to here. So by the way, the ice age advances in the Himalayas were not so dramatic because our latitude is low. So the plains were still warm. Whereas in Europe, North America, etc., the plains were also freezing cold. So there were huge advances of ice over there. In uh, Himalaya, probably 50, 100 kilometers and not very much more than that. So let's come back to now uh, Fourier. <laughs> While he did not know about the laws of radiation, 1824, he didn't know. <laughs> he made a, I mean, um, Consider the very thing that what how does the atmosphere uh, influence the temperature? Uh, so uh, this guy, I don't know how to pronounce him, D. Saucer, he was so basically the experiments this guy uh, the D. Saucer did was hot boxes, like our solar cookers. So you have some insulating material. This is my version of it for demonstration purposes thermocol box and uh, three plates of glass and shove in three thermometers there and just put it outside in the sun and this is what the measure 94 in the lower thing the temperature decreasing as it goes up uh, <clears throat> so then basically I, I feel it a sort of inspired guess so he says yeah okay in these hot boxes temperature is decreasing as you go up in the atmosphere also same things happen Hill stations are cooler than the ground, even if we are in the same uh, latitude, temperature keeps decreasing. So, and uh, the reason the temperature uh, is uh, decreasing upwards in the hot boxes is because of the glass. So, he gets that uh, the energy is coming in in the form of light, and uh, what do you call it? It, uh, it passes through the glass, and then it gets absorbed by the walls over here. And for some reason, the glass traps it and doesn't let it go. Uh, so he says that uh, is this uh, was this basic the thing that it behaves like a glass in a greenhouse. That's why this is called the greenhouse effect. So now, next question is what what in the atmosphere makes it behave like glass? So first answer was this lady, Eunice Newton Foote. Um, she did some experiments with bottles filled with water, carbon dioxide, etc., measuring their temperatures. Won't go into the details, but first she says uh, action increases with density. So, okay. Then the action of sun rays were found to be greater in moist than dry air. So that means that uh, in modern language, water vapor is a greenhouse gas. Uh, the highest effect was on carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is the old-fashioned name for carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide she identified as a greenhouse gas. And uh, she realized that uh, this can have an effect on the climate. I mean, very complicated English, old-fashioned English. But uh, all said and done, it says that if these gases are more in the atmosphere, it would be hotter. Then very soon after that, and independently, there were these more systematic experiments done by Tyndall. Is a solid state physics, light scattering. It does a Tyndall effect and so on, which uh, also is known for. Uh, so he was motivated by the previous, uh, what do you call, previous work on this greenhouse effect. 
And uh, his uh, thing said that water vapor is a, a major greenhouse effect, must produce change in climate. Then carbonic acid, CO2, and hydrocarbons like methane, etc. So he identified large number of them. So though these are present in very small amounts in the atmosphere, they are what? I mean, the rest of oxygen, nitrogen need not be there. Uh, whereas, uh, the, I mean, as far as the uh, light coming in, I mean, the radiation balance is concerned, it's only these gases that matter. Oxygen, nitrogen, etc. transparent to light, transparent to IR. So they simply don't uh, matter in this. Incidentally, it's a nice problem. Why are nitrogen, oxygen not greenhouse gases, whereas water, methane, nitrous oxide are? It's a answer is in quantum mechanics. Basically, these are uh, what do you call it diatomic gases. So they have some center symmetry, which prevents the absorption of IR. I won't go into it, but it's an interesting side like how quantum mechanics matters. So then after Fourier and these experiments, radiation, so physics of radiation started getting understood. So uh, Maxwell's equations were around 1860. So at that time it was realized that light is an electromagnetic wave. I don't know when people realized that heat also was. The radiated heat was also electromagnetic wave, but must have been pretty soon after that. Then the laws of radiation started coming. So there's the Stefan Boltzmann law, which gives you how much radiation energy is, uh, um, uh, how it depends on temperature. So basically it tells you hotter the body, the more the energy uh, that is uh, radiated out. Then the Wien's law, which uh, tells you that what is the wavelength in which this energy is radiated. And the fact that higher the temperature, shorter the wavelength of the peak of the radiation. And so all this goes together to understand the greenhouse effect of uh, Fourier, etc. So the this is coming in the form of visible light, getting uh, passing through the atmosphere, getting heated. Uh, I mean, it's coming in form of visible light because of the temperature of the sun is very high. Then the temperature of the earth is lower. So what the earth emits is in the infrared. And so that is, so, so the uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere get through the light and stop part of the outgoing infrared radiation. And so now after all this was known, only then you could make some quantitative estimates. And that was done very soon after, the 18, uh, 1896. And if you go back, Displacement law was 1893. So as soon as all these were discovered, um, the uh, Arrhenius uh, <clears throat> uh, made a quantification which I'll describe you. But look at this part of his uh, paper. Uh, and from here, you can see it again following up on work by previous people on their letters. And I would not have it. Uh, taking up all the tedious calculations. If, but because of this lively discussion about probable causes of the IK. Okay. So he then knew from the IK that there were changes in climate. They knew from Fourier, etc., that it was greenhouse effect probably controlled it. They knew from Tyndall, Fute, etc., that uh, what are the greenhouse gases. Then all the laws of radiation became known. So the stage was set for Arrhenius to. So he, it's a remarkable paper with what you call it, uh, fantastic data analysis. And I won't go into it, but he, uh, this is the language that uh, uh, if the carbon dioxide doubles, then, so basically this says that the temperature increase will depend logarithmically on the carbon dioxide concentration. That's what uh, this sentence says in old fashioned English. And uh, so, if the carbon dioxide doubles, then he estimated that the temperature will increase by about 5 to 6 degrees centigrade. Now, this logarithmic dependence has been confirmed by all the complicated climate models. This 5 6 is probably current best estimates 
is more like three, two to five is the current output. But you know, he had very bad, I mean, didn't have great data. Um, so the beginning of the 20th century, it was known that greenhouse gases control the uh, temperature of the earth. And uh, there was an uh, estimate that if carbon dioxide doubles, then the temperature will increase by five to six degrees. So next significant thing was in the 30s, this is a British uh, engineer called Calendar, who asked this question, okay, uh, he estimated the, how much uh, CO2 has been added in during the industrial uh, period. And he had some estimate of how much remains in this atmosphere. The three quarters is probably too much, but anyway. So he estimated that, okay, it should be rising at three degrees per century. Three, um, if he applied the formula of arrangers, et cetera, et cetera. Now, is it actually doing so? He examined all the data that he had long-term. By the time there were med stations in various parts of the world. And so there was data available. And you can see one of them long term records is from Ilabad. Um, so he has, I mean, you can see the girls are not so great, but they're very noisy, etc. But all said and done, he roughly estimated that it actually was consistent and it's uh, increasing at uh, 0.5 degree per century. Nowadays, it's more like 1, 1. 1.5, etc. But this was in 1930s. Next question that was asked was, is the CO2 uh, in the atmosphere actually increasing? I mean, we know we are emitting from the factories and all like calendar estimated, but some of it is getting absorbed back by the earth. Uh, so calendar was theory that only about three fourths of it remains. What is the data? So this is the um, famous paper by Keeling, Charles Keeling, who um, yeah, is carbon dioxide from fossil fuels. This is 1969 or something. Yeah, 1969. So this is the uh, his result of 10 years of very hard work. So from 62, no, 58 to 68, 10 years of observations in this Moana Loa laboratory in the Hawaii. And uh, um, uh, found very, I mean, clearly increasing trend. This up-down oscillation is a seasonal effect because down, not other hemispheres, other hemispheres, that's the thing. But the trend was clearly increasing and he estimated that CO2 concentration will double in 600 years. Right now, it is very much less. This was in 1960. Um, so that lab has continued these measurements and this is the, the what is called nowadays the Keeling curve. CO2, atmospheric CO2 concentration versus time is uh, called the Keeling curve. And you can see the slope here is much less than the slope here. So it's increasing much uh, fast. Now, okay, it's increasing fast, etc. but how to compare? Uh, meaning, uh, so one needs to know something about the temperature in the past. So that's a whole field called paleoclimate, which is uh, very extremely, I mean, it's scientific jasusi, jasusi meaning detective work. You look for clues, then you uh, sort of try to interpret them, do some dating, do this, do that, and get fantastic uh, conclusions about the past. Now, this ice uh, core uh, is one of the methods they use. And I find it um, appealing because it's very direct and straightforward. Anyway, so this whole thing started in 1957. Um, so the idea is that in the Antarctic and Greenland, in the polar uh, land regions, whatever snow falls becomes ice and doesn't melt. Little bit will be melting, but much more falls than ice. So the ice keeps growing and uh, it gets thicker and thicker. In fact, in Antarctica at the moment, the, at the South Pole, there are four kilometers of ice. So going to the South Pole is like going to Ladakh, you know, 4,000 meters above uh, sea level. And uh, then the deeper you go, the, what do you call it, older the ice. You got that. So you dig up these cores uh, from uh, like, like this, and you can see striations over here. 
So apparently, because the summer rice and winter rice there's some slight difference, they show up uh, like three days. So each uh, striation is one year. So you can actually count the number of years and estimate when uh, a particular uh, section of the ice was deposited. Now, this falls as snow and then compacts as ice over many years. So many years, meaning maybe over in Antarctica, etc., maybe 10 years, 15 years, not. So there are small bubbles of air trapped inside the ice. And now with, you know, even a small sample, you can just figure out the chemical composition of the atmosphere at that time. So you know the CO2 levels and you know the chemical composition of the thing. And then this ratio between heavy water, I mean, D2O and H2O and O16, O18 gives you a uh, measure of the temperature. Because of the slight difference in molecular weights, the vapor pressures are slightly different. So uh, the, the ratio of the heavier and the lighter thing is determined by the temperature. So that gives you a measure of it. So then slowly, you can 57, the initial experiment thing started. 87 was the first paper, 30 years. Because a lot of details had to be sorted out uh, before you could get uh, conclusions. So it was uh, quite slow. Then after that, 87, 99, I mean, then it started coming. Initially, some uh, so 420,000 years, and finally, I think 800,000 years is about the limit you can get from Antarctica because given the depth. So, this shows the results of one of the ice core things, the Vostok uh, ice core, version one. The, this is the temperature fluctuation, and this is the CO2 fluctuation. Firstly, you can see they're correlated when one is high, the other is high. Then uh, let's concentrate on the temperature. Uh, so this is present and this is 400,000 years. So there are one, two, three, four peaks over here. So basically four glacial cycles, one every 100,000 years. Uh, this, uh, this thing. And uh, past, of course, have been very constant. Then there are other fluctuations. So it's not only 100,000 year period around. But the big peaks are 100,000 years apart, roughly speaking. Uh, then you can look at the, so if you look at the rate of warming at what seems a very sharp finger, it is typically or less than about 0.1 degrees per century. Today, it is more than 1 degree per century. So uh, it's warming about 10 times more than it ever did in the past. Uh, there have been occasional events here, but by and large, more. Then the maximum level of CO2 in the past, when you see, is about 300 uh, ppm. So today it is 420 ppm. So if, um, within 100 years, it has. Uh, okay. So now, why are the glacial uh, cycles there? Sort of accepted theory is is because of the changes in the Earth's orbit. So these are called Milankovitch cycles. Milankovitch was an um, astrophysicist who... Uh, so the orbit of the Earth would be fixed if there were no other planets and it was just a two-body system. But the influence of the other planets influence the orbit and there are small changes um, uh, going on in it. Jupiter, for example, has a strong influence. So there are three kinds of changes. Um, one is a period of, uh, so one is this 23 angle tilt with respect to the ecliptic. That keeps changing with a period of about 40,000 years. Then that axis goes, mutates, I think is the word, it goes round and round like this. That happens with 26,000 years. And then the ellipticity of the orbit sort of periodically changes with a period of about 100,000. Now, uh, so in this paper, what they did was take a Fourier transform of the ice core data uh, available to them and found that these three were the dominant periods. So the conclusion was that it is this Milankovitch cycles and change. So by the way, these orbit changes cause small changes in the amount of energy coming in from the sun. 
So this was the changes that were, uh, I mean, so this correlation. Now it's more or less accepted that the Milakovic cell said that if you look at past 10,000 years, uh, okay, and with, uh, the, it's very small, very slow changes in climate, and these numbers give you 0 0.01 degree per century, 0 0.6, except after the industrial age, where it suddenly started increasing, and 1900 to 2000, there's been an increase about 1 degree. So very much faster than what uh, happened in the past. So then next came the development of mathematical models, uh, physical physics-based mathematical models. Now, these came about roughly after the 50s, even the simple ones, because you needed computers to get any good information out of them. So, after the development of uh, computers, these things uh, started developing. So, the first simple ones are called energy balance models. They just math you know, convert into mathematical formula the phenomena that I discovered. Incoming energy is going to output energy. And uh, whole Earth is one or divided into, say, ocean, land, atmosphere, four or five things. And uh, you have how some model for how energy is transferred among these components, how it is radiated, etc. Uh, so they can only give you global information. Uh, and uh, but the, the thing is, it boils down to solving only ODEs. So computationally, they are very uh, cheap. So you uh, usually think that if you, you want only gross information, you can have a simpler model and um, less which involves less computation. Uh, then the detailed models are actually simulate the entire atmosphere, solve the Navier-Stokes equation for the whole uh, atmosphere, the flow, and the oceans, and input a whole lot of other processes that go on, which make them very complicated. Uh, and because it is very complicated and, you know, detailed, uh, they don't run very reliably for more than 100 years. So uh, that's the amount you can project using these models. Uh, energy balance models can run for longer, but they don't have spatial resolution. So initially, it slowly developed. Initially, there was a separate model for the atmosphere, separate model for the oceans, and they were just sort of coupled in a way by uh, boundary. One gave you boundary conditions for the other. Then uh, they were uh, integrated into what is called this uh, atmosphere, ocean, global circulation models, uh, which also included some modeling of the polar ice caps uh, region. And after 2000, have come these well, Earth system models. These are the state of the art models uh, nowadays. They not only ocean the atmosphere, they also have a de more detailed model of the carbon state and other geochemical systems. Um, I see carbon dioxide also, it's going from the atmosphere, coming back into the land and going back again. There's a cycle there, like many other. So this one um, includes them. So these are the state of the art models. So just a break for some comments. You, as you know, 2021 Nobel Prize went to, physics Nobel Prize went to climate scientists. And uh, so Manabe's contribution was basically one of the initial climate models. So this thing, the uh, energy radiation balance was roughly speaking Arrhenius' model. You model how the energy comes in, it radiates, and there's an atmosphere where it does something. The a very important other process is the convection current set up by this temperature gradient. That also hugely redistributes the heat uh, uh, and energy in the atmosphere. How to include that was Manabe. So there's a very famous paper, 62 by Manabe Wetherland, on uh, 1D model. I mean, so simple in uh, today's terms. But it included this process and made it from a radiative model to a radiative convective model. And that was actually Manabe's uh, contribution. 
Hasselman's contribution was more sort of in the data analysis. He, you know, the um, what are called detection attribution study. So he studied the all climate data is very noisy, um, always very fluctuating. Very, so how to extract the signals from the noise? That's of course an old field. Electrical engineers have been doing it for a long time. So his contribution was how best to do it for climate, for climate signals. So he developed this method called fingerprinting, where uh, you could do that, and a lot of conceptual understanding also he did, which I, uh, but you can see the effect of his work. So uh, I'll tell you what these assessment reports are, but in 1990, the IPCC report uh, said sort of, yeah, it may, I mean, the uh, greenhouse gases may or may not be responsible for the uh, global warming, even 95. Uh, in Tar, they said, okay, maybe, this AR4, 2007, they said, yeah, definitely. Uh, Hasselson papers was written in the 90s, early 90s. Then other people, you know, it takes about 15 years for any new seminal work to get absorbed by the community and then start getting applied in Nagar. So this is really the detection attribution study which is very important. You know, how do you attribute, how do you know that this climate, firstly, is Initially, there was a question that is the thing warming or is it just noise? Next thing is okay, if it is warming, is it due to human activities? So the extreme events which are happening increase, is it due to climate change? So uh, these are the kind of studies that go into detection and uh, attribution. Now, actually, the third Nobel Prize was his award, also had a, a thing in climate. But uh, though his main work he got the Nobel Prize was for spin graphics and complex systems were different thing. But uh, he had written one uh, paper on uh, how to understand this 100,000 people. So the puzzle over in the glacial cycle one is that the uh, change in the uh, sun radiation coming, that is the forcing of this 20,000 20, and 40,000 year cycles is much larger than the forcing of the 100,000 year cycle. Forcing of the 100,000 year cycle, the weakest. But yet, when we saw that, uh, you know, I score data, the big peaks were coming once in 100,000 years. So the response of the 100,000 year cycle is strongest, whereas the forcing is the weakest. So a nonlinear response. Uh, how to understand that? Uh, the concept of stochastic resonance that uh, he wrote which I don't know much about and I don't know how well it is accepted in the community, etc. But that was <laughs> Parisi's uh, big, I mean, major idea at least that he has put in into the field. Uh, okay, so, after, so all this got known and in the nine, or early 90s or 88, I think, uh, there was a need felt to sort of disseminate this yeah, information to Janta. Uh, so that is when the IPCC was formed. Um, Intergovernment uh, Panel for Climate Change. Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. Set up mainly by the World Health Organization. So what it does is it doesn't do, uh, they don't do research. They review all the published work in the field and come up with these assessment reports. So these assessment reports are basically big, uh, what they call, review articles. Um, and they have a huge team of uh, authors selected from all over the world to do that. So they have put out uh, the first assessment report was 90, second in 95, third in uh, 21. Then they shifted to a more sustainable nomenclature. Fourth one, 2007, 2013, and the last one was uh, 21, two years ago. So let me just sort of summarize what they say in the latest one. Firstly, that human influence is strongly has really won the climate. It is now unequivocal, so it's really uh, beyond doubt. Uh, then the other thing is blah, blah. And 
one new thing in this is that this evidence that the extreme weather events are because of them. You see, this was always conjecture, uh, always theorized that you heat up the climate, the whole system is going to get more volatile. So they are going to be in your probability distribution of extreme events. The tail is going to get larger. There are going to be more of extreme events. So that was always the thing. But now there seems to be data which is uh, supporting this thing that many of the extreme events we are seeing are uh, can be attributed to the warming climate. So this wasn't there earlier, but now it's coming in this seems to be. Now, these are the uh, predictions. So again, uh, I said IPCC prediction means not that they are running the models. They about there are 40, 50 Earth system models running all over the world, including one in IITM Pune, Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, Meteorology in Pune. Uh, they have a ESM running. And uh, so this is, uh, they combine all the results in some way. And this is, uh, that is what this projection is. So now this, so now what is going to happen in the future depends on the emission scenario. How much greenhouse gases we are going to emit and how much greenhouse gases uh, accumulate in the atmosphere. So these are different emission scenarios, which I'll uh, talk a little bit more. I'll show one more slide. So this is low emission scenario and these are high emission scenarios. So these are the two scenarios where by 2100, the climate will, sort of, will stabilize around two degrees or less. And in all the others, it won't stabilize even in 2100 and keep increasing to higher levels. And uh, so these are the um, corresponding sea level changes. So uh, early part of the this century, the sea level change will not depend too much on the emission scenario, but in the later part it does. Then they also point out that there are some what they call low likelihood high impact possibilities. If huge amounts of ice sheet pieces in Antarctica, Greenland break off and go off into the ocean, um, which is not predictable, you know, because a, a break off meaning it's a fracture process. So intrinsically, it is not a very, you know, uh, I mean, so, uh, it's not uh, easy to model. Some cracks start somewhere, it will propagate, you know, the fractures are not. You can statistically model them at best if they're not easy to deterministically model. So, uh, but uh, it can't be ruled out. So, it is possible that there may be some meters of uh, sea level rise, um, or maybe two meters of sea level rise in by next century. In fact, uh, just yesterday I was hearing a webinar on this and uh, on, by uh, IPCC people. So, what they're saying now is that, see, Two meters sea rise is going to happen, no matter what you do, no matter where. Only issue is when. In this, uh, you know, uh, low likelihood high the thing, it may happen much sooner. If in even if you control the climate, uh, etc., I mean, control the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it will take longer, but. Eventually, two meters sea rise uh, level rise is going to happen, is what they are saying. That's uh, it, not a question of if, but when. So, now these are the uh, emission scenarios that correspond to the. We'll, I'll come back to them, but let me go. Uh, now, it's clear that temp uh, global average climate, in the sense of global average temperature, will stabilize only if the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere stabilize. Now, and the uh, temperature, it eventually stabilizes that, uh, will depend on the stable con concentration of greenhouse gases. Now, uh, there's this, uh, what do you call it? Um, Paris Agreement, when, uh, when was it, 21? No. 1916, let's say, okay, 15, uh, which made a big this thing of let us limit the global warming by 2100 to 2 degrees centigrade. 
1.5, preferably 2 at the most. And these are still the numbers that are being talked about. So let me go back a few slides. So these are the two scenarios which are consistent with the Paris uh, goal. Uh, so these are the two degree lines. So here they are going to get stabilized. More or less stable. Actually, they are almost leveled out by 2100. The rest of them are almost three and higher and red. Okay, so now, so this is the SSP 2.6, 1.9. Now, this is the scenario for 1.9. Now, uh, so this is 2015. So from 2020, the annual emissions are supposed to sharply decrease. So today, it's supposed to be, according to the scenario, sharply decreasing. It's not happening. They are just uh, increasing. Not only that, then after mid-century, it's supposed to go below zero. Below zero means you pull out more at, uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than you're emitting. So there are these CDRs, they call them, carbon dioxide removal. Day. So this involves some geoengineering at global scale and pretty dangerous things. Uh, but there's no evidence that you can do it on a large scale. And the other 2.6, again, it's supposed to start decreasing now. And after 270, it's supposed to become negative. Now, these curves actually have stabilized only because these have become negative. Uh, because see, even after you uh, stabilize, suppose you make your greenhouse gases level constant. So, I mean, so you emit zero. In the sense, you emit only as much as can be absorbed by here. Then the level will be a constant. And at that uh, time, the energy balance has still not set in. So, you know, the constant, so, but then slowly it will still keep heating up till the energy balance is achieved. So, even after you stabilize, the temperature is going to keep rising for a few hundred uh, years more. So, even this two, uh, uh, the stabilizing can happen only if you start pulling out uh, from the atmosphere. So I think this two degrees, 1.5 and all of their political slogans is not going to happen. Uh, the best one can hope for is here that it, it starts stabilizing around two, two, 20, 50, 30 years from now, you uh, start decreasing your emissions and slowly keep going down. And this corresponds to a, probably a rise of 4 degrees centigrade or something, I'm not sure. So this uh, thing I was talking about, you know, that uh, even after you stabilize your uh, greenhouse gas concentrations, it will take some time for the energy balance to set in. So how long will it take and or however long it takes, what will the final uh, stable temperature be for a given uh, this thing? That is sort of characterized by what is called the equilibrium climate sensitivity. This concept was actually Arrhenius' initially when he said that when he, when he talked about change in temperature for doubling of CO2, it was actually a long-term change in temperature. So back of the mind, what is assumed is this, that you had a sort of st steady level of greenhouse gases. Then, uh, uh, I mean, this is over uh, not thousand years, uh, centuries. Then a sharp rise for a couple of centuries. And then somehow you manage to stabilize them again. Under this scenario, eventually what, what temperature will be, uh, what will the temperature stabilize? To? That is what is given by the equilibrium climate change. There is dispute about this, but uh, if, uh, um, I mean, the ECS is really, if, if the carbon dioxide doubles, what will, it, uh, what will the temperature stabilize? To? And uh, current estimate is somewhere between two and five, most probably three. But there is dispute about this. It's not at all a settled issue because the processes is, are, are complicated. And um, so it, it, there's another new concept which has come up, which is there in AR4. There is this observation that um, if you plot the total cumulative carbon dioxide emissions 
from 19, uh, no, from industrial age, versus the rise in temperature, it so happens that it uh, lies in a straight line, linearly correlated. No, it's not clear why, but um, so this is data, and then these are model projections, and it's true for all the uh, scenarios. So then one can, um, what do you call it, uh, sort of give an attribution that um, uh, how much of the current uh, uh, rise, okay, as I said, it's not really uh, clear why. It is just observed both in observations and models. And there's a paper by one uh, person from IFC, who actually I'm trying to collaborate with, who shows that, that it's not good. It's just in a specific parameter regime that this linear relationship would happen. And it so happens that industrial age still now falls in that regime. Uh, anyway, but so it also gives you that uh, you can extrapolate and give you a carbon budget. So if you want to limit your um, temperature at 2100 to 3 degrees centigrade, how much carbon more can you limit by extrapolating this stuff? And then today's increase of say 1.5 above industrial, which part of the population has contributed? How much in terms of? So, you know, Western nations or... Uh, so... Uh, 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 who is responsible for the uh, temperature rise till today? Or how much is each person responsible? How much is it? I'm deliberately not saying some... Uh, I'll come to that. So, okay. So, given all this, what does the Raman Fan do? Uh, how do you fix it? Clearly, how to fix it is you have to stabilize the... Uh, 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 greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. How to do that? That's a complicated, very, very complicated question. So, um, yeah, so I think, so really it's complicated because all negotiations, in the international negotiations, are nation to nation. And if you look at all the, in the media, you say, okay, India is producing so much, America is producing so much, China is uh, emitting so much, blah, blah, blah. All uh, talk is in the framework of nation to nation. But really the issue is rich poor, not nation to nation. So for example, if you plot the per capita uh, income versus per capita emission, I've just taken this data from this uh, site, uh, so it's not a very, but you know, there's strong correlation. Higher the per capita income, the more the per capita emission. And all everybody, I mean, people say China, India are the big emitters, but we are just on the straight line. We are emitting according to our income. I mean, <laughs> you know, Qatar is the highest emitter per capita, is a rich country. I mean, per capita, I mean, it's uh, this thing. And uh, this is, so this is another way of saying the same thing. These are a paper by two economists, one from JNU, one from Amherst. Um, so this is the share of the emission of the top 10% income and bottom 10%. So it's a funnel, higher the, higher the income, the larger the share of the emissions. So, so whoever can afford to uh, consume energy and therefore emit does so, Whoever cannot afford doesn't do so. It's really a complete rich poor issue, sir. And, and uh, this is here global scale, India scale, then it's there at all levels. Same thing. Um, so that's, I mean, how to fix it is uh, goes beyond just climate. It's huge. The social change is required. And so that is beyond my syllabus. <laughs> all that I know is it's going to be very, very tough. But okay, so, but okay, how to fix it is beyond, but how to monitor it? That is when you can, you know, uh, all said and done, the important thing to look at is the screening curves. 
it is supposed to flatter. You know, it's the that is direct measurement of the atmospheric uh, thing. The uh, uh, so uh, that is the thing that is supposed to stabilize, and data for that is easily available on the internet. All one can keep on it to see if all these talks and the stops, the various this thing, are they working on the ground or not? Is easy to check. How to make them work is different kettle of fish. So. Um, I mean, so look at this. This is the Keeling curve. So, by the way, in this site, this is the Mauna Loa data. In this site, they have stations from 50 places and all. So, they give you global averages, etc., which is the more relevant thing than Mauna Loa is one site in the um, So, all this, so this is COP27 occurred just now. Uh, it has had no effect on this curve so far. This is supposed to go like this and flatter. At some point, it's going to flatter. It has to. If uh, so, uh, I think thank you for your attention and please keep an eye on this girl. Thank you so much, Professor uh, we take a couple of questions. Uh, let us just see uh, if there is anybody online and if they wish to ask any questions, they are more volatile. So, uh, hello. Hello. I guess, no. Okay, so we take questions from the audience here. Hello, sir. Uh, thank you very much for this very nice talk. So, I had a question, uh, a very nice question about the ice age. Uh, so, does this glacial cycles comes within this uh, one ice age? So, I have a conclusion. Okay. Uh, each cycle is called one ice. Okay. Okay. So, one whole period, then it warms again. So, that whole period was one ice age. So, how many ice ages that uh, happened to Earth uh, till now? The big I say is that, oh, let me go back to that. It's uh, actually an interesting. Um, eight big ones. Um, yeah. So you see, uh, so the blue is where you have ice core data, and this is. Other paleo data. So, uh, if we are, at past 100,000 years, they've been happening. Now, before that, also, there are not a lot of oscillations, but I don't think there, were, there are clear things of ice ages. Now, Milankovitch cycles would be happening, happening all the time, you know, right from uh, the time the Earth was formed. But uh, the, whether they create a response of an ice age depends on the state of the Earth. Okay. So, but uh, confirmed ice ages are uh, eight from ice core data, uh, eight in the sense of eight big peaks, 100,000 years, and probably a few more. So I have one question. So does this movement of the straight tectonics have any contribution to create this ice ages? Right. Not significantly, because it's a, uh, well, um, okay, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> because after all, Antarctica would not have been there at some time. It would have been somewhere else. Uh, so, I mean, like, for example, um, um, right now, um, North Pole, there's no land. It's an uh, it's ocean. And all the ice in the North Pole is floating ice. Antarctica is a huge continent at the South Pole. Uh, sometime back, you <laughs> it may not have been the case. So, in that sense, of course, it will affect where the land is, but but I don't think direct effect on the climate. And all these are largely affected by the tectonics, right? So volcano, well, you know, uh -huh, because that's a process that's going on um, at the crust, meaning it's going from the magma to the surface. Okay, climate is a surface phenomenon, so. Plate tectonics will be only indirectly affected. Indirectly. Okay, thank you so much.
So I have one small question regarding the milling milling cars that you showed. Uh -huh. Very regular oscillating pattern. It's yeah. Right to explain, but uh, I did not understand that. Yeah, actually, I didn't explain. So <laughs> yeah, you uh, I'll do that. I'm just kidding. So uh, so basically, this is a uh, the this is twice a year. Huh? I mean uh, annual. Uh, so in the the northern hemisphere, have much more land than the southern hemisphere. Southern hemisphere almost completely sea. There's Australia, Antarctica, and South America. There is, uh, so there are many more, much more plants in the Northern Hemisphere. So during the Northern Hemisphere summer, much more photosynthesis takes place. So much more carbon dioxide is absorbed from the atmosphere. So there's a dip during the Northern Hemisphere and a peak during the Northern Hemisphere. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so I I do appreciate that you know you don't know uh, you know how to solve it. No. Point taken. But uh, for uh, still the you know the people who are going to face the music ultimately probably we all be dead. Yeah, but people who are, who are going to face the music, do you have any suggestion in any way of any any intervention? That on a personal level, not governmental levels, not country to country talking. Uh, on a side note, the uh, number of which are very less is probably a boom in a very convoluted sense. Yes. Okay. But, but there. Yeah. Please, carry on. Uh, But for this, these people who are going to face the news, can you suggest on a personal level anything, any intervention which you think might yeah. help? Uh, uh, by the way, the number of which are very little, few in number. But they are the guys who make the decision. They are the guys who control the governments and so, and they are the guys who, actually, I should say we, we are part of that. Uh, people who can protect themselves against climate change also. So I'm quite pessimistic on that. But okay, I think uh, overall, you have to reduce consumption. See, for a let me, I mean, so that's the only way as I see that you can uh, not it won't come simply by technology. I mean, for example, uh, let me just take a example. So suppose you convert all cars to uh, EVs. Now, firstly, there is a question of what happens to those batteries. So there are other environmental uh, consequences. And uh, it will still be consuming a lot. So instead of that, what you should try to do is make public transport very current. Hugely invest into public transport so that number of cars actually have to come down. So that's what I mean by reduced consumption. I think we can't continue to consume energy at this level and simply switch to non-carbon uh, non sources of energy. Uh, how to convince people to consume less is So, some question there? Yes. Anyone? You can still talk to him. Uh, he is there with us till uh, lunchtime, a little more. And uh, if there are no more questions, uh, let me just hand the speaker. Uh, join me in thanking him. Uh, we would like to present a small moment to the speaker. Uh, I request the sir. So I actually read a paper on uh, how much carbon is consumed or emitted. Uh, for producing photovoltaic batteries, uh, paper okay. was there on that. Yes, please. Yeah, yes, uh, laser engraved ice and logo. Uh, and logo. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Uh, so the online uh, people. So, sir,